Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call the Finance and Audit Committee meeting to order. Uh, the, it's the September 22nd Finance and Audit Committee meeting. I'd like to first recognize, of course, that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Sinemic First Nation. Our clerk this morning, as she was last night, will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Uh, today's Finance and Audit Committee meeting will be held in accordance with the Community Charter Council Procedure Bylaw 2018 number 7272 and Ministerial Order Number M192 Governing Open Meetings. As the province has moved into Phase 3 of the reopening plan, question period has been reinstated for those in attendance for agenda items only. The question period sign-up sheet is on the table by the double doors to my left. And if during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet, and I'll call you up at the close of the meeting to the podium to address Council. Uh, before I go to the first item on the agenda uh, and the introduction of late items, I do uh, think it's only appropriate, I gather, to wish uh, Councillor Brown, who uh, is coming to us electronically this morning, uh, a very happy birthday, I believe. I'm not sure what uh, exact number it is. I've heard rumours that it puts him clearly out of the youth category now and, and into uh, middle age, so to speak. But. Uh, Apart from that, uh, we all just want to wish him a very happy birthday and welcome him to the meeting. Uh, the introduction of late items, we have none, Ms. Gurry. A motion for adoption of the agenda. Moved Councillor Thorpe, seconded Councillor Hemmons. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion for adoption of the minutes is circulated. Moved Councillor Thorpe, seconded Councillor Hemmons. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. And the first presentation has a very sh short title, but uh, it's going to keep us going today. The presentation is the 2022-2026 financial plan timeline. And Ms. Mercer, good morning and welcome. Thank you, Your Worship. That's my mic. Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, we thought we would give a brief overview of uh, our upcoming budget timeline. So um, I'll, if I can get the next slide. Thank you. So our first day uh, is October 29th, and we will be presenting some budget highlights, and then we'll start in with our uh, presentations for our, develop, or our um, department business plans. So on our first day, we will go through the CAO's office, legislative services and communications, human resources, corporate services, which includes finance, uh, IT, emergency management, and police services and RCMP. And we'll finish off uh, with Nanaimo Fire Rescue, and that will be um, from 9 till 4 uh, at a special Finance and Audit Committee that day. Our second day will be November 3rd, and it's from 9 till 2, and we will continue with department business plans, and we will do development services, uh, parks, recreation and culture, and engineering and public works. And we will... Um, end the day there, and on November 5th, we will have uh, operating and capital projects, and we'll go through the highlights of projects that are included and in, not included in the 2022 to 2026 draft plan. And we will also do a brief introduction of the discussion points that we'll be going through on November 10th, which is the next meeting. So on November 10th, we will do a recap of our um, projected and projected tax and user fee increases, and go through the budget drivers. And then we'll um, go step by step through council decision points. So at that point, council will be um, asked to make decisions on whether to add things or not to the budget. Uh, and then on November 15th, we will do our public consultation, which will be the E-Town Hall meeting, and that'll be at a regular council meeting um, at seven o'clock. And then after that, we will have our second budget recap on November 19th, in case there is anything that comes up between um, the first budget recap on November 10th and anything that can't, comes out of the E-Town Hall. And uh, assuming all things go smoothly, we will come back on December 6th for first three readings for the 2022 to 2026 financial plan bylaw, as well as the water, sewer, and garbage bylaws for 2022. And uh, again, all things being um, status quo, we will come back on the 20th for adoption of all those bylaws. So that's the plan for our upcoming uh, financial plan um, process. So be happy to answer any questions if anybody has anything. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mercer. Ms. Gurry, I wonder, is it possible to get the second screen up? We're not... <laughs> not that I object looking to my right all the time, but... Ah, voila, thank you. Another miracle. Any questions for Ms. Mercer on the timeline? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, there's no uh, delegations unrelated to agenda items. Uh, the next report, the Nanaimo Operations Center and the business case. Mr. Sims, good morning. Good this morning, Your Worship, Council. Appreciate the opportunity to be here in front of you again this morning. Um, so a little bit of background, you know, council may be aware that the public works business case or the, the, the plan for a public works meeting is a building has been in the works since the mid 2000s in and out of the budget. It's an easy one to shuffle down the road. And as council's aware, I think that uh, over the last few years, our work has been intensifying uh, at looking at um, the opportunity or the need to, to revisit this operations center. Um, you may have heard me say before, and I'm trying to get into the, the North America wide mindset of, of public works as being the fourth emergency responder. We're not as cool as fire or police because we don't wear utility belts or have badges on our shoulders, but often we are the ones that are, uh, the community relies on in most of most larger scale disasters. Um, you know, our staff, our equipment, our fleet, all of that needs to be ready to go. Um, so I think with the need for increased resilience that we're seeing around North America, I think we really want to be able to respond to any opportunity. So the work that Mr. Rosen will present to you today is really the culmination of several years of work, including some space planning and a lot of thought and a lot of iterations have gone through, um, starting uh, at least five or six years ago. And we've come to the realization that the most appropriate approach is to, to consolidate all or a good portion of the operations um, that the city does, including parks operations at one facility, because there's a lot of shared resources. So I think, you know, I'd really like to acknowledge the project team that drove this and spearheaded by Mr. Rudolph, Mr. Rosen, John Elliott, Mike Strain was our project manager. Uh, Mr. Groot and Mr. Harding were also heavily involved. Um, the, the intent really is to, this is to provide a, a set of information to council. This is, this is sort of the culmination of all this work and we're just putting the information on the table, recognizing uh, the expensive need or the expensive nature of this project. We, you know, staff really need to come back to you with a, a broader context, you know, how does this fit in with the several other needs of the community. So including not not to be uh, forgotten the RCMP facility. So that's sort of next down the road, but this is just to put the information out there and to let it marinate. So without any further, I'll pass it on to Mr. Rosen. And Mr. Groot. Good morning, Mr. Rosen, Mr. Groot. Thank you. Is it possible to raise that? <laughs> yeah, see? Nice. That's much better. I, I don't want you to I think you're... To look like, um... I don't want you to think you're in kindergarten this morning. <laughs> better, better. Perfect, that's a lot better. Okay, thank you. You guys hear me okay? Is that right? Okay. So about a year ago in September of 2020, council allocated some funding for a architectural concept uh, of an upgraded public works, as well as the development of a, a more reliable cost estimate. So that, that work is now complete, as well as a, a whole bunch of surrounding due diligence, and it's all been packaged up into a, into a summary business case. 
Um, the report that's attached to this presentation has the business case attached to that. So there's a lot of information that was created as part of this process. There's probably several thousand pages worth of documentation and work. Obviously, that couldn't be attached to the council report. So we've set up a project website that has a lot of uh, links and the reports and different things. So if there's interest, it's, it's possible to go there. We've added the links in the, in the report. So just for quick access, if there's interest. So this, this presentation will really just provide a bit of a high-level summary of the, the report and the business case. And if council or the public is interested in delving in deeper, there's obviously uh, avenues for that to, that to happen. Let's try this guy out. Okay, so obviously the primary focus of the study was the, was the public works yard at 2020 Labio. It, it houses between 130 and 150 staff, depending on the, on the, the situation and the season. So a whole number of services that are provided out of that location. But as Mr. Sims mentioned, as part of a comprehensive review of operations, it's incumbent upon us to review the, all the parks operations at the same time because there is a lot of overlap between different workshops and different sort of shared services and so on and so forth. So we also undertook a review of the parks operations sites at uh, Prudhoe Street and then their annex up on Nanaimo Lakes Road. What we've what we've developed is a comprehensive business case that includes a review of all of this and provides a path forward for um, identifying a way to bring it all essentially up to scratch. So this next little bit is really a summary of what we would call the problem statement within the business case. So why, why are we looking at this? Like what, what, is the current, what is the current problem? So the existing facilities have served us well for many, many decades. And, and, and we certainly appreciate that, but there are some pretty significant concerns, which is, which is why we're here today. This, this list of issues, it's really not meant to diminish our appreciation for the facility, but really just to highlight the, the, key, the key points. So I'm gonna jump, I've got a slide for each one of those bullet points, and we'll sort of jump into one each, by, you know, each at a time, and we'll talk a little bit more of that in depth. So facility condition. The original buildings on Labio were constructed in the 1960s, before amalgamation. So I believe at the time it was outside the city limits, so that's a little bit of a puzzle. The Prudhoe buildings, those were actually the previous city's public works yard. So they predate the construction of the buildings at Prudhoe, or at, uh, at Labio. So building age doesn't necessarily mean that it's unfit. There are a lot of building systems that that uh, are components that age differently. For example, a structural system will age more slowly than a typical mechanical or an electrical system. Things like architectural features like doors and windows and wall finishes, that tends to be what people interact with and quite often will form judgment over a building based on, on, on what, they're, what they're seeing with those things. But it doesn't really tell the full picture. So what we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a, a, a third party come in and do a detailed assessment of, of public works and they would be able to approach it, because they're a third party, they'd be able to approach it from a dispassionate viewpoint. Um, so no predetermined opinions or anything like that. So we had a consultant come in and do a very detailed assessment. They created about a 600-page document, which is available on the website. And it, it highlighted a whole series of upgrades that are required just to sustain what's there. And many millions of dollars attached to that work. Resiliency and emergency preparedness, seismic risk. So when the buildings at Labio and Purdue, when they were constructed, they would have been built to the building code of the day. But at the time, our understanding of earthquake and seismic risk around this area of the world was very limited, if, if, if at all, if we understood it at all. So the, 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 the outcome of that is, because these buildings all sort of predate our understanding of that, they're, they're, they're and they weren't designed for it, there's, there's a risk that they might not be able to be serviceable or, or, or survive a, an earthquake. So a number of years ago, we undertook a seismic screening of all the buildings at Public Works. So that was a really high-level screening to prioritize which ones we should look at further. So that was done in, I believe, in 2012. The result of that was it identified the fleet maintenance facility as the most high-risk 
of the buildings at Public Works. So in 2018, we engaged uh, a third party engineer to de complete a detailed seismic review of the fleet maintenance facility. The result was what we had feared, and it's extremely seismically vulnerable. Now what this means overall is, in a post-disaster scenario where the community is relying on public works to fix water mains and sewers and roads and bridges and all those things, there may not be, or in the case of a fleet maintenance facility, there likely won't be a facility for them to operate out of. So it'll make it extremely challenging or almost impossible maybe for public works to be able to uh, respond to an emergency. So as we all know, Fire Department number one, Firehouse number one, has the city's emergency response center, the ECC, primary ECC. But we also have a backup ECC, which is housed at Public Works. And you can see in the, in the picture there, there's a, a modular office structure. That, that's where the Public Works meeting room is, but it also doubles as the backup ECC, as well as the departmental operations center. And as Mr. Sims mentioned, the departmental operations center is one of the most it is the most activated operational center within the city, and I believe it's been activated five times in the past couple of years. Um, so it gets, it gets quite a bit of use. And because it's attached to a seismically vulnerable structure, and it's really just a series of uh, modular units on blocks from a post-disaster standpoint, we can't count on it. Capacity and operational efficiency. So since, since Public Works, the buildings were constructed, the city's population has more than doubled. And over the coming decades, the city's population is expected to grow substantially. The lack of office space is acute, and it's been that way for a number of years. There's been a number of locations or a number of spaces within the building that have been converted. So things like closets and various unsuitable corners have been sort of, staff have been jammed in, in there. We've also had uh, bring in trailers and park them in the parking lot just to, to house some staff just because of the office space um, limitations. The repair bays, so the fleet maintenance repair bays, there's some of the larger vehicles, the larger fire trucks and garbage trucks, they don't actually fit in the repair bay, so they have to be repaired four seasons sort of outside. It's not the end of the world, but it's also not ideal. In terms of crew muster, so in the beginning of the day and the end of the day, all the field crews, they congregate into what's called the bullpen, and it can be quite chaotic. And the, the challenge there is communication. So supervisors communicating with their staff, exchange of information. Because of the chaos, it can be a little bit challenging to receive or get instructions or what have you. So a little bit of an opportunity there to improve things. Mr. Rosen, can I ask a question? And I think the, the public would want to know this. Um, I think we're all very conscious of the seriousness of the <coughs> seismic suitability of the buildings we have. Um, are there other buildings identified in the private sector that would be available for repair work if there was a, an earthquake, a crisis? So you're saying are there buildings out there within the private sector that we could move into in a, in a scenario like that? Commandeer as necessary. The, the challenge with that is if the building is already designed as a post-disaster facility, and it's not occupied, that, that might be a possibility. But it takes a long time, like literally years, to retrofit a building to, to make it sort of post-disaster ready. So we, I mean, we, we could identify something like that now, and that actually is one of the slides I have is where I talk a little bit about that as an opportunity that we explored. But it would be something that we would have to, to do now and prepare for and, and have a, a defined plan. Um, no, I appreciate that. Again, I'm, I, I want to emphasize I'm not diminishing the the priority that needs to be given to this, but I simply want to know, is there a contingency plan in place if the disaster happened, God forbid, touch wood tomorrow? Presently, there's no contingency plan. Thank you. Okay. Safety and security. So because the buildings were constructed uh, many years ago, they don't meet the current building code. This isn't necessarily a problem, but the building code does reflect a lot of societal expectations and norms that uh, someone looking at them now would find a little bit puzzling. Um, things like safe access and egress from the lunchroom is, is an issue that, you know, when it was created, maybe it wasn't, it wasn't an issue. It was compliant with the code of the day, but now it's become a concern. 
about, I think it was about six years ago, we had a security audit completed for Public Works, identified a whole host of deficiencies that existed. And we have implemented a small number of those sort of higher priority, but because of the capital required, we weren't impl able to implement the vast majority of them. So there's, there's, there's quite a bit of um, control and security deficiency associated with Public Works. Workforce equity. There's a whole series of areas around public works that are only accessible through stairs, which at the time, the code of the day, that would have been okay. Now, you know, if we have someone there that has mobility challenges, it, uh, it, could, be, it could be a little bit uh, embarrassing or a bit of a challenge for us to accommodate them. Gender equity is another one that, that you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago wasn't as, wasn't as topical. One thing that we've discovered fairly recently was that, that the women that were working at Public Works, they had to get changed in the female washroom and take turns in the hall. So when we discovered this, it was, okay, we obviously have to correct this. So we, we actually converted the first aid room into a female change room. We did that this year. The, but the reality was the first aid room still has to exist. So we had to bring a trailer in to, to house the first aid room. So now we have the first aid room sitting in a trailer in the parking lot. Environmental. So because a lot of public works was constructed using modular buildings, there's a, there's a whole host of them out there. They are not built with permanent energy efficiency in mind. They don't have a lot of insulation in them. So the per square foot energy use at public works is, is quite high. We also have several vehicle wash down stations. So there's two vehicle washes and a, and a garbage truck washout basin. Unfortunately, those are connected to the downstream storm sewer. And although staff try to avoid having debris and so on enter, the down, it's, it's, it, it needs some, some, some work and some attention to, to avoid having debris and, and things like that entering the downstream, the downstream water course. Another important piece here is fleet electrification. We all know that the city's fleet is going to be migrating towards EV vehicles in the next number of years. How are we going to charge those? We're going to have to install charging stations and, and, and questions around the, the public works uh, electrical service capacity. Like, Do we have enough capacity within the service to be able to support all that charging? That, that, that's, a, that's something that would have to be uh, reviewed and implemented um, as we go forward. So, Your Worship, this, this slide speaks to some of the, the, the comment that you made earlier. So when we were undertaking this project, we wanted to make sure that we, we weren't missing out on a potential opportunity, so we wanted to make sure we cast our, our gaze kind of wide. So the primary focus was an upgrade to the current public work site. We have a working yard there, it's about the right size for us, and we knew we could make that work, but we just wanted to make sure that there was no other opportunities that we were missing. So we did explore an opportunity. There was no opportunity, it turned out, but we did explore the idea of obtaining access to uh, an office building nearby, uh, but there was no interest on, uh, on, the, other, on the other party. So that, was, that, that, that opportunity didn't, didn't pan out. One of the important pieces with that was proximity to public works. It would have to be very close to public works for it to be of, uh, of significant value. The other idea is a greenfield, a greenfield site. So the idea would be there would be to obtain sufficient lands suitably zoned in the right area of the city for a completely new public works operations yard. And, and that, that, that is, the challenge there is actually finding the land. We don't have a lot of land of the size that would be necessary for, for an operations yard. And the other challenge there also is the, the cost because we were able to develop an option that, that essentially reused a, a bunch of the buildings and facilities at Public Works. If we went to a greenfield site, we would have to build everything from scratch. Um, so we would expect that the cost would be considerably more. So as Mr. Sims mentioned, to complete this work, we pulled together a project team that consisted of uh, a city steering committee in accordance with the city's project management framework. And there was a whole series of consultants that, that, uh, that helped us through this process over the past year. In particular, CapEx Project Advisory, uh, Casey and Architecture, WSP, and then the cost consultant was BTY Group, and then a whole series of others. So this is the existing public works site. There's just a couple things I wanted to point out here. 
as we talk about the master plan in the next slide. On the left, to the north of the site, is the temporary modular housing that exists right now. To the south of the site, there's a fire training facility that has that concrete tower where they burn solid fuel. It creates a lot of smoke. So it's a bit of a challenge there in terms of introducing more staff sort of near that part of the site because of the smoke. So anyway, that's a piece that we'll talk about a little bit later, but that, that would have to be dealt with. And I think I wanted to point out was the tree buffer along the, the east property line. So there's about, between the public works fence and the property line, there is about a 14 or 15 meter piece of undeveloped land that currently has quite a few trees and vegetation and so on. Because of the, because of the space requirements, that, that, that tree buffer would have to become part, of, uh, become part of the future public works yard. So this slide shows where we ended up with in terms of uh, overall master plan. Now the red, the red rectangles represent new buildings. So to the right, it shows the new fleet maintenance building, which would be fairly close to the fire training tower, which is why we would need to convert the fire training tower to natural gas to avoid the smoke and so on. The rectangle along Labio to the left is the new administration building that would house a lot of offices, you know, crew, uh, launching rooms and, 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 and things like that. The building just beside the administration building, that's sort of a square shape, that is a purpose-built uh, storage facility. So it's really just a, a rain cover over a bunch of materials. And then there's a whole host of ancillary sort of unit processes or other pieces, including like bulk materials handling, um, snow and ice control, brine creation, salt storage, uh, refueling. You can see those two gray uh, polygons. One of those is the purchasing and stores building, the existing purchasing and stores building, and what we also call the truck barn. Both of those are planned to be uh, renovated and incorporated into the, the overall master plan. So one of the important pieces with the development of this, because we have a working yard and during any changes, it has to remain a working yard. It has to be functional for staff that are continuing to work there. We had to phase things. So the first phase that we came up with was the construction of the fleet maintenance building, as well as the storage building. And the, the reason we've done it this way is because of the location of sort of parking and swing space and different things like that. And the architect, Kazian, thought through this in quite a bit of detail to make sure that these phases would actually work for the operation. I don't think I need to talk about each of the phases, but you can see the, some of the unit processes, the salt and the bulk materials come in in phase two. And then phase three is where we bring in the administration building. And then finally in, in phase four, where we've done the renovations to the existing buildings, all the unit processes are in place. That's where we can sort of merge some of Park's operations and sort of reorganize things at that time. But it's a long, it's a long process. I believe it's about a five or six year process where we go from phase one through to phase four. So this is an architectural rendering of the sort of the front face of the, uh, the main administration building. So when we were instructing the architect, we, one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that they produced something that was functional and utilitarian, something that was durable, something that was going to last a long time, but something that didn't have a lot of sort of bells and whistles on it. it, it and if you look carefully at the lines on the, this building, the geometry is very sort of straight lines, very simple. There isn't a lot of complexity to it. The, the, the blue feature on the front really is to provide a, an aesthetic face to the building. But it's actually, if you look at it, it's actually quite a simple feature. And fleet maintenance is a little bit more of the same. You can see the simple geometry. It's really just a, a box that has a, a few little architectural components on it to, to, to give it a bit of a face and a personality. And the storage building really takes the utilitarian philosophy to the extreme. It's, it's pretty basic. I have a question. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Groot, who's going to speak Sir a little Martin bit about has a question, Mr. Rosen. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I, I like the look of the building. 
um, through through your worship. But the the roof is flat. Are we planning anything green for the roof? That's a great question, Councillor Martman. So one of the things the city has is a, a green building policy. So in that policy, which by the way is, is under review and we'll bring forward some options to council in the near future on that, but currently it dictates that the city will build to a lead gold standard. So as part of the development of these concepts, we, we, we knew that, but we also knew that things have moved the industry has moved on since the city established that policy a number of years ago. So we, we might want to do something a little bit different, maybe something a little bit more progressive even. At this stage of the concept, we didn't go into the detail of designing something like a green roof or what have you. But what was important was that the consideration for that was baked into the cost estimate. So in, in the cost estimate, we've included, we've included an assumption that we would, we would target lead gold but also that we would deal with stormwater in a way that meets modern expectations. So what that means is um, controls for both volume and stormwater quality. Because the site is largely impervious, we have to do something fairly substantial. And so one of the things that we're envisioning having to do there is probably we would have to build some fairly large tanks under the ground to store the stormwater and, and let the solids and so on settle out. Um, that may not be enough. We may also have to, on the buildings, we may also have to introduce green roof, a green roof scenario. Anyway, I guess my point is that decision is for further down the road, but we have included in the proposed budget for this enough money to be able to cover those types of things. Oh, perfect. Thank okay. you. Leonard. Leonard. Councillor Thorpe and then Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Mr. Rosen. Uh, thanks for the information, Mr. Rosen. I, I uh, appreciated getting this report, and uh, I think getting this project initiated is is in itself long overdue. So I appreciate the work that's gone into it. Uh, I, my impression of our Public Works Department is that they are a bunch of uh, city employees who keep their heads down and just go about their work day in, day out, and keep our city running. And they are the nuts and bolts of our city. And this is a project that we cannot allow, in my opinion, to shuffle down the road any further. So I'm really pleased to see that this is uh, getting uh, brought before us and we're taking the first steps. I did have a question though, specific to the, um, the um, plan uh, rendering. I don't know what slide it is. Um, uh, specific to the fire training tower. Maybe I am mistaken, but I thought I'd heard in discussions uh, from Chief Doyle that there was some desire to move that facility on the part of the uh, uh, fire rescue department. And if so, then that land could be available for expansion for the public works department. A am I incorrect there, or is that something that has been looked at, or is it something that could be looked at? Through your worship to Councillor Thorpe. So as part of the identification of that smoke being a problem, there was a lot of discussion with the fire department about how we would deal with that. And so that, you know, relocating that fire training tower was one of the options that we talked about at length. At, at the end of the day, you know, the conversion of that existing facility to gas resolves the problem. And it also allows them to have their training facility adjacent to their, their, their fire hall, which, which from an operational efficiency and cost standpoint, is far superior than to having an independent fire training facility that has to be, where they have to essentially have the, 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 the folks training sort of on overtime or, or what have you. So there's a huge operational benefit for the fire department to have that facility really close by. And we were able to resolve the smoke concern. Um, so although the space would be nice to have, I think given the balance of cost and, and, and issues, I think where we ended up by converting it to gas meets everyone's needs and sort of resolves the issue. So, yeah, thank you very much. Councillor Brown. <coughs> thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Rosen. Um, was uh, prefab industrial looked at for any portions of this? So the, the, like for the, the building type, was prefabricated industrial uh, structures looked at for any of this? So as part of the discussion with the architect, our initial intent going into this was, was a pre-engineered 
industrial structure, and that would meet the geometry needs of the building. The, the problem is, and I'm understanding this from the architect, is that those types of buildings don't tend to be very durable. So what we're envisioning with this building is that it's going to be fit for purpose for you know, 50, 60 years. Those pre-engineered buildings, they, they tend to have fairly limited, um, limited amounts of insulation, um, cladding, uh, and those sorts of things. And so they tend to have a projected lifespan of much less, like 20 or 30 years. And so the architect was really encouraging us to avoid going down that road because we do have, we, we did want this to be a post-disaster facility and we wanted it to be durable. And that, that, that wasn't consistent with uh, a pre-engineered type of uh, building. So okay, that, that, that's why we ended up with. Okay, that came from the architect? Yeah, that's a good point. Mr. Sims mentioned the storage facility. So as, as we, you know, if, if we move this project forward, the storage facility might be one that we could consider, um, you know, a pre-engineered type of structure. There's, there's a fair bit of flexibility with that particular one. Okay, thanks. So I will mention that I am coming back in a couple of slides to sort of wrap it up, talk a little bit about budget and things like that. But I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Groot for a couple of minutes to, just to talk about the... Uh, the, the parks operations piece. Thanks, Mr. Thanks, Rosen. Mr. Rosen. Good morning, Mayor Kittle. Um, just a little bit more information regarding the location for park operations and then also the Nanaimo Lakes Road location for park operations. So as Mr. Rosen had mentioned, um, this location predates the construction of the public works yard. So that, you know, gives it its age. And then also um, uh, many of the challenges that Mr. Rosen discussed regarding the, the public works facility, um, they exist also for the, the park operations location. Um, up until about 10 plus years ago, all of park operations uh, was working out of the uh, Prado Street location so that, that right now it says um, turf, which includes sport fields and, and neighborhood parks. Um, horticulture, utility, and trails all operated out of here. And um, the one bullet or the one uh, group that's missing here is also the carpentry slash civic facilities group. So you can see that if we look, I mean, this is a very good picture. It actually doesn't paint the picture of how crowded it is because you can see that a lot of the vehicles are away and what have you. But at the end of the day, when even now, when some of the, the, the sections no longer operate out of here. The, that parking lot on the right-hand side where the white vehicles are, is it is a, a bit of an orchestrated movement to get everyone, everyone in at the end of the day. And then similarly, there is a sequence required to get everyone out at the end of the day. And you can see there is no um, um, on-site staff parking. It's, it's the street in front, beside, around. So that ends up being some challenges as well. Um, on the left-hand side, there's some temporary structures just for us to provide some coverage to some of the equipment that should be housed inside, but there's just currently no space. So, um, like I said, about 10 years ago, um, two of the, the sections in the department, um, utility and trails, moved up to the um, Annex Road location or the Nanaimo Lakes Road location. And so, not an ideal location from a um, you know, dispatch perspective to the community in its entirety, but it was ideal from a, a um, space location and some extra laydown area, which then made operating out of both locations safer just from a staff movement perspective. Let's go to the next slide, Paul. And then this is the, for those who haven't been up, this is the, the location up at the Nanaimo Lakes Road. Um, like I had said previously, trails and utilities operate out of here. Um, the building on the left is, uh, the, uh, is a shop where, where various um, operations are, are um, taken care of. The mid building is the old water board office, and that's where the offices are housed. And then there's, there is a block building on the right-hand side there that uh, was being used whilst the, the water reservoir was in service. So um, that would be a building that could have a future use just based on its, uh, on its construction. But due to the nature of the construction of those other facilities and their age, um, an investment in those um, doesn't really, really make sense. So the intent would be that these two groups um, would move to the um, Public Works location at 2020 Labio or the Nanaimo Operations Center as we're starting to transition to because it's a, it's a combined consolidated operations center. Um, civic facilities would also move to Nanaimo Operations. Horticulture and um, 
um, sport fields, neighborhood parks, you know, just due to the proximity of so much of the horticulture work downtown, some key sport fields, artificial turf fields, um, it makes sense for those, those operations to stay there. And, and the improvements at Parks Yard would allow for many more years of operation out of that location. It would end up acting as a satellite location for all of Nanaimo um, Operation Center staff as a drop in. There's going to be a couple of offices available from a manager slash supervisor perspective. So space was some of that, you know, the, the, the issue. So we, we needed to look at the Purdue location as a, if we can't all fit at the 2020 Labio location, utilizing this as a long-term satellite location for ongoing city operations makes really good sense just based on its downtown location. So that, that's the intent of the improvements at the 89 Purdue location as well. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Mr. Rosen. Okay, moving along. So this graphic is what we call the trumpet. This is a graphic out of the city's project management framework, and it, what it shows is the, the, the project stage and what the typical uh, uncertainty is in the, in the cost estimate. So for the Nemo Operations Center, we're currently at what we would call the concept design stage. So the cost estimates that we have and the budget that we've sort of put forward, it has a confidence interval of sort of plus 30 to minus 20. So just, just bear that in mind as we, as we move forward. Now, one of the things that we wanted to prepare was a cash flow forecast. To be able to do that, we had to come up with a potential construction schedule. So one of the core assumptions within this is that the construction would start in 2023 to align with the likely departure of the supportive housing at the north end of the yard. And you can see the duration of the, the project through all the phases is quite substantial, you know, six years out to 2029 before we're able to actually realize the 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 reorg like the, the the full vision so the cash flow diagram is is really key here you can see there's a lot of funding required for this this project this this adds up to 125 million dollars of that about 30 percent of it is contingency so there's a pretty healthy contingency which aligns with the maturity level of the project but because the project is quite long in duration and it, and it doesn't start until 2023, we've had to bake into the, the, the funding what's called escalation. So things like inflation and so on. So our cost consultant has determined what that should be for this particular project. And there's about $17 million in escalation alone baked into this budget. So it translates to about four to $5 million a year um, for this whole package of work. So if we push the whole thing out by a year, we would have to raise the, the budget by about four to five million dollars. Conclusions and next steps. So we realize this is a lot of information to absorb for, for everybody. And we realize this isn't the only facility with significant capital needs as well. So our plan is to come back to council with some options for funding as, as well as some consideration for other facilities at the same time. So we're anticipating doing that within, within a couple of months. And so the next steps will be a bit more information around funding strategies and, and other facilities and so on. So that's, that's it for my presentation. Happy to receive questions. Thank, thank you very much, Councilor Mertman. Thank you. Uh, through you, Your Worship, a couple of questions. The first one, in the report, it mentions that early stage environmental assessment indicates four locations require some type of environmental remediation work. Do we have any, is there any more information you can provide on that? Through Worship Councillor Martman. So that stage two environmental work has been ongoing. They've been working hard at it and they've been doing sampling and testing and so on. And I wouldn't say that we're free and clear, but there, there's still some, a few outstanding tests that need to be done that do show that things like the salt has potentially migrated from the pile. Years ago, we didn't have a cover over the salt pile so there was potentially a bit of salt migration from there. So that's one of the concerns. And I think, I think that's generally the gist of it. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's not terrible, but there's still okay. a little bit of outstanding concern that we have to work through on that. Okay, thank you. And then if I may, um, the other one that's noted um, is the temporary housing that's uh, next to the site. Has there been conversations with BC Housing? Good question. Has there been conversations with BC Housing? My understanding is that, that BC Housing is, 
is seeking uh, an extension, and that may have already happened. So, Your Worship, I can speak to that. So, <clears throat> that is, I think Council is aware that you've recently extended the lease arrangement with BC Housing for that site uh, for another two years. So, I think it was to expire, and it's now extended for two years. So, uh, that's, a, that's something to be mindful of. So, it's uh, that if that continued longer, that could affect the the program for this this project. So um, that was always intended to be a short term arrangement, uh, and it's gone now two years longer than the original concept. So, and I believe my understanding is BC Housing is quite motivated to uh, get uh, get into more permanent housing arrangements because it's a cost model that they're they're finding expensive to service with those trailers there. So. The site definitely is needed for the public works function uh, to take place on its site. So, and it, again, according to the schedule of phasing, it will. Uh, it, it seems like it's. It will be fine as long as they right. they honor that uh, original lease, and um, have those uh, facilities out of there, in something that uh, matches with the schedule for this project that ultimately has to get approved by council. Thank you. Council, any further questions? Uh, I have Councillor Bonner and Councillor Armstrong waiting on Zoom for you. Please, Councillors Bonner and Armstrong. We'll go with Armstrong first and then Bonner. We'll go alphabetically. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, should Council approve this? Are we ready to go so that if there's going to be a lot of uh, Canadian infrastructure grants available and, and apparently they're going to be quite large sum, would we be in a position to take advantage of that? Through worship of Councillor Armstrong, so the funding that we're anticipated for this is likely going to have to come through borrowing. So that, that can only happen through a public process. So we need to come forward with uh, some strategies for Council to consider as part of that. Once, once we've sort of thought through that, and, and obviously grants will be a part of that discussion. Um, so I think that, that question will likely be answered at the next session on this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Bonner. Please. Thank you, Worship. Um, a couple questions, if I may. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of options in, in this. It looks like here's the plan, um, and I'm sort of looking at it as you, we either accept it or we don't accept it. Um, um, as an example, um, why not sell Prudhoe Street? I, I, I'm, I'm quite confident that I'm sure with proper um, uh, architectural drawings and, and uh, people doing the work that we could fit everybody in on the Labio site. Um, so that would be an option of raising funds to actually pay for this thing, but it's not in here at all. Has that ever been considered? Mr. Sims. Your Worship, that was one of the original premises um, within the core services review a number of years ago. And so the, the um, the recommendation was to consolidate parks operations and public works operations and sell the, the Prudhoe yard uh, at a cost of, or at a, a revenue of about $900,000 at the time. It failed to recognize that we'd need to spend a significant amount of money to replace that. Um, that so it, it's not that that option would not be considered, but at the same time, as Mr. Groot noted, the, the focus of the operation uh, that is envisioned to remain there horticulture and uh, turf fields is largely focused in the downtown. And so that proximity allows for um, a quicker response. The other piece of, of the downtown uh, cleanliness that is sort of brewing in the background uh, from a public works and parks operations point of view is, is just, you know, general street cleanliness and having a facility nearby just helps mobilization for simple things like sidewalk sweepers. So not off the table, certainly, but at the same time, uh, it's a valuable resource for the city's operation in the downtown. I, I can add a few more pieces to Mr. Sims' commentary there. So as we started this project a number of years ago, we had assumed that all of the Prudhoe Yard could migrate over to Public Works. But as we started thinking through and talking about the implications, what that would mean operationally, things like horticulture that have a large greenhouse we realized that there's an existing greenhouse at, at Purdue that if we were to incorporate it into the, uh, the Nanaimo Operations Center, the costs would be substantial because it's got quite a large footprint. And, you know, it, so that, that piece, and because they spend most of their time downtown, 
the thing with um, the thing with that is when staff arrive at work, they have to go from wherever their their muster point is to their job site. Mm -hmm. So that that travel time is non-productive. So the closer you can be to where you're working, the more productive you can, net productivity is improved, right? So if you're spending a lot of time downtown, it makes a lot of sense to have your, your, your muster point sort of nearby there to avoid that sort of non-productive time. Councillor Bonner, any further questions? Uh, yeah, like um, I'm going back to my, not a lot of options. Um, I was just looking at the design and I'm not an architect or anything by any way, shape or form, but to me, like uh, we're looking at creating, putting the maintenance building um, next to the uh, fire hall um, area there. And to me, and, and in order to do that, we have to change the fire hall. So why don't we just put the maintenance building to the far left where there's a parking lot and put the parking lot next to the, the area there. And, and parking lot, I mean, for the vehicles, large vehicles. I mean, it's just some of these things, uh, uh, it's, it's such a large amount of money um, that I would really like to see options so that we can uh, pick and choose things. I, I understand that staff is experts at this, but from a political point of view, this is a lot of money. Thanks, just my comments. Through your worship to Councillor Bonner, I can describe a little bit about the process we use to arrive at the master plan because certainly we, we recognize this is, this is a really big deal. We want to make sure we get this right. The, the, the challenge with developing the public works yard as a, as a master plan is, is partly what I mentioned around the challenge of maintaining an operational yard. So whatever path forward you develop, you have to have a path that it can maintain the operation during that construction period. So that, that in itself adds quite a substantial constraint on things. And there's a whole bunch of things like the architects were calling them adjacencies. So where you want to have certain, like a good example of that would be you want to have the bulk materials area close to the folks that are looking after the stores so they can supervise the, the coming and going of, you know, retrieval and, and, and supply of these bulk materials. And so you need to have certain turning radiuses for vehicles. You need to have, like, there's a whole bunch of, there's literally thousands of things to consider and, and obviously, to Councillor Bonner's point, we did consider having the building at the, the north end of the yard. We considered it having it in the middle of the yard. We considered a whole suite of options. And certainly, if there's a strong interest, we could bring forward more information on how we arrived at that. But my caution is it's so complex and complicated that, that I'm, I'm not sure that it would be particularly uh, fruitful. So, Thank you, Mr. Rosen. I, Mr. <clears throat> yes, Your Worship. <laughs> um, I think uh, this is the intent of today. I just want to outline process a little bit. And the, the intent of today was just to put it on the table. I mean, this has gone through a vetting process, and this is the staff's best recommendation as to how to proceed from the Public Works uh, Department. Um, that's not to say that there aren't options and so forth and some of that could be on the phasing some of that could be inputs on design There's a whole thing around that. So uh, at some point in time, there's going to have to be a consensus. This is the project and uh, So then the second part of this is the fiscal <laughs> uh, If we are certain, uh, you know, how, how do we unpack the fiscal side of this? Um, how much is it going to cost? What would be the dates and so forth? That's where the finance department has to come in and and provide a whole set of information how this plays into the overall budget and with the assistance of the public works. The third component of this is the uh, formal approval process. So as Mr. Rosen has indicated, it's anticipated this project and others will require some form of voter assent, either by uh, alternate approval process or a referendum. So uh, that's, the, that's the process we have to go through uh, to get to some sort of end game and then everything starts to kick in. <clears throat> the interesting component of this is this is not the only project that falls under this category. We are similarly undertaking a review process for the, the police facility, which is, uh, is not in a good place. It's got many similar characteristics of, of, of uh, alternate uses being found uh, there's uh, the, the, the facility has now crept into two other buildings in terms of using the proposed reuse of the existing fire headquarters once it's uh, as a temporary measure until it's uh, 
relocated uh, into uh, until we get a, an arrangement. So once the fire department is out of there and into their new building, it can be used by police. Similarly, the uh, the police have currently uh, taken over some space in the leased facility on Fitzwilliam next door. So there's going to be a similar presentation to you on the police building. It's not as far along the process as this one. Uh, but we will be giving you a briefing on that. It's, it's expected at next finance and committee meeting. That is a multi-million dollar solution to a problem. <clears throat> and then the third and fourth projects, the third would be the waterfront walkway, which you're well aware of. And there's a, there's a, a process that needs to get done on that uh, to get to yes, which means permits and approval from council and so forth, and the electorate. And the fourth candidate project that's currently not on budget, which is much smaller in scale, could be a future uh, community center in the south end or the Chase River area. And that, that there's project work being done on that. So you have to look at this as part of all of these projects in the fiscal side. And Councillor Bonner is right. There's a large amount of money and it will have to be if, if these projects are to go ahead, and somehow there has to be solutions for at least a couple of these, uh, it has to be done in a fiscally acceptable manner. Uh, so, uh, we, so the first part is to get certainty around the project. The, the second is the fiscal analysis. The third is the legislative services approval process. So we'll be layering these in sequentially, but um, one of the goals uh, in my business plan is to get all these projects to a level where we're very clear what the problem is, what the solution is, and what the, what the path forward is. So it's going to be a multi-year pro process. And uh, I think we have an opportunity over the next year to firm this up as best we can. So uh, uh, there's an awful lot of information here. And I, I guess the other thing I would layer in on the finance side is we already have debt. <laughs> And we are sequentially retiring some of that for the conference center and other facilities. And we're inheriting new debt. We just took on debt for the new fire hall. So you recall uh, in the annual presentations from the finance department, the, uh, the uh, debt charts that show how much debt we have uh, and, and by type of debt uh, and how it skews out over the course of the next 20 or 30 years. These projects would have to be layered in on top of that. So we know how much debt we can take on. Um, in, in the, you know, there's a threshold, we're way below that, but how much do you want? And how much does it actually then cost? Is this a levy that gets assigned to the tax bill that would be X amount of dollars for so on? So it, there's, there's going to be a, a fairly robust fiscal analysis, but we have to get past the, the, po the point of agreeing with, that this is the project and then it would be a matter of how to proceed with it. And uh, I guess uh, all of these projects will take time and it's not going to happen quickly. But we, as Councillor Thorpe has indicated, we are we are doing our best to have results and uh, and a plan for each of them. So um, we'll we'll revisit this concept again at the next time uh, we we meet on finance with the police building, and uh, we need to build out a a plan. So we've got this plan, police building, the waterfront walkway, and possibly the Chase River Community Center projects all being on your agenda for this coming year. Thank you, Mr. Rudolph. Councillor Gesselbrock and then Councillor Hemmons. Thank you, Worship, uh, through you to staff. Um, I'm just curious, like say for a project like the Operations Centre, are those type of capital projects ever eligible for like, federal or provincial grants? <coughs> so they're okay. I missed that, thanks. Mr. Rudolph. Um, well, I'm not sure I, and I, I would say this, that getting back to the question of grants, we will surely be putting in applications for grant support as we are shovel ready with these projects. An example of finding money that we, we are pleased to get was recently the announcement for Metro Drive, where we were funding that project and we got grant money back. So uh, obviously we would be seeking, seeking uh, grant funding as well, but we can't rely on that. That would be a, it's almost like a, hoping you win the lottery a little bit. Uh, you you got to also plan for the scenario where you may have to do it yourself. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I agree with Councillor Thorpe and the necessity of obviously doing this work. I feel like I re relate it to being a homeowner and the roof and the foundation and the furnace have kind of all gone at once. Um, and we need to think like that. 
I'm curious, so we've had a couple of big projects go over budget, and um, as a result uh, of COVID and a few other factors, are we, uh, are we planning for that in this? And I know it's very early to track financials, but are we, are we incorporating that information that our projects have gone over budget into this one? Through your worship, Councillor Hammonds. So as I had mentioned with that graphic that showed the, the trumpet and the sort of level of project maturity, we're at that concept level. And, and traditionally, the error is sort of plus 30% to minus 20%. And, and certainly, we're, we're aware that COVID and, and so on has really sort of changed supply chains and, and construction costs. You know. So we're certainly aware of that. And we did hire a very competent co quantity surveyor, like a cost estimator. That they, they do nothing but quantity surveying and cost estimating. So they're real experts at this. And so in this case, we're, we're relying on them to, to recommend the appropriate you know, unit prices for the various pieces of work associated with this, as well as the escalation and the anticipated impact from the, from the pandemic and so on. So when they were developing this cost estimate this summer, they certainly were aware of the cost implications of of COVID and so on. But the challenge is, what is that impact going to be five years out? They can't, they can't look that far. So we've, we've assumed that there's this escalation baked into the, the cost estimate in the budget. But really, the farther you go out, the less, the less confident you are with that, with that estimate. Okay. So right, right now, we're pretty confident in the budget. If we were to move forward with this right now, we're pretty confident with it. But certainly, there's no guarantee. Right. You know, we could we could have a, a change in costs that would impact the project, but we do have a pretty healthy contingency uh, within it, and so we're fairly confident with the number right now. Okay, thank you. And one through to Mr. Rudolph, um, you mentioned the different uh, we could do a referendum or an alternative approval um, for something like the public works yard, which it seems to be a requirement, yeah. um, would we ever send that to a referendum? Because if the well, answer is I, no, I may I defer that question to uh, our director of legislative of services because we have had a fair amount of con so she can outline some of those options and and you're you're onto something that we certainly have discussed. Ms. Curry, um, thank you, Worship. Through you to Councillor Hemmins. Um, yes, there is. Um, if it's a community amenity, like a waterfront walkway or a recreation center, community center in the south end, um, the public um, approval process is more likely to go to a referendum for a community amenity. So it could be a referendum that stands alone or it could be a question on the ballot for the next election um, for cost saving measures and the cost is significantly greater for a referendum. When it's an operational building or an operational um, amenity that's needed, um, an alternative approval process um, is probably the way um, to go process-wise because if it, um, if it fails and it still needs to proceed, council then can turn and put it um, to a referendum or the question on the ballot. So timing of these is um, something to consider when we come back about process. Um, if, if council was to choose the alternative approval process for the operation center or the RCMP building, it might be beneficial to do it prior to, like close to the next election. And then it, it um, has two opportunities, should the first one not be successful. Um, because if you do an operational um, amenity via referendum, and the answer is no, then that answer is no, it's final. There's no mm -hmm. way to go further, at least not for some time. Um, and uh, there's like a six month or more time and then the cost is substantial. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, Council sorry, Councillor Bonner. You're so distant in that little screen, I apologize. I'll, I'll, I'll move closer. How's that? Better. Um, I, I do have a question, it's, and it's probably regarding grants and the ability to get them. Um, would we, in, in terms of um, shovel ready projects, that sort of thing, do we have a better chance when the, uh, the project is in the one to two million dollar mark instead of the 10 to 15? Has, has there been any experience on that? Ms. Mercer. Um, through your worship to Councillor Bonner, 
we, I would say the competition for a larger dollar um, project is, is heavier. Um, there's more submissions perhaps to that. Um, whereas the small ones in, in the past, we've been successful with smaller grants. Um, we have been successful with larger ones, but you know, if I think there has to be some equity in how the grants are distributed. So if we've received a large grant, we may not get the same consideration if we apply for another large grant. We are always open and, and ap apply to any grant opportunity that comes up that's applicable, but our, how successful we are really depends on how many applicants they have and what other projects um, have been submitted. So it's sometimes we get a big grant, sometimes we get a small one. It's, it really isn't anything that we can predict. Um, we do our best. Uh, to describe the project and meet the criteria of each grant. So it, it, it's hard to say whether, you know, one is better than the other. Um, there's a lot more smaller grants, so therefore you tend to be statistically more successful because there's more of them. But if I had a crystal ball, that would be great, um, but I don't, so. Seeing no further hands or questions, Mr. Sims, Mr. Rose, Mr. Groot, thank you very much for this morning. Notwithstanding, it may not be as uh, exciting as a seawall, it's uh, still pretty exciting, I think, for the city. The next item is Community Development uh, Program Development Grant, the Sailor Storm Hockey. And Mr. Harding, you're going to kick us off on that? Yeah. It's going to be a slap shot, not a kicking off, if it's the hockey part. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, please, I'm going to turn it over quickly to Ms. Wark and Ms. Clarkson, who will uh, give you another, um, introduce another opportunity of a community development grant, particularly for, and this one is the Coast Salish Storm Hockey Group, which we've been working with on another project, and, uh, but I won't take their, their thunder, so I'll turn it over to Lynn and Laura to go over the, the program and answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Work. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm here this morning to recommend that the Finance and Audit Committee support the grant request for the Salish Storm Hockey Association to receive a community program development grant of $4,500 to assist in their Storm the Ice hockey program. So the Storm the Ice hockey program is consists of two elements. There's a basic introduction to hockey for new players and developing players. And then there's a stick and puck component, which is specifically for skill development, where half of the ice will be used for children and youth to develop their stick handling, um, or yeah, stick handling skills. And um, the other half of the ice would be available for free skate for the family members who come with the children and youth to have some skating time while they're developing their skills. So this program is uh, being put in place by the Salish Storm Hockey Association to support a successful introduction into sport and to support families in learning how they can get involved in more organized sports in the future. It's also to promote the health benefits associated with being involved in sport, and it helps to remove some barriers in terms of getting involved, such as um, the barriers of things like finances and transportation. Um, so staff has reviewed the application. It meets all of the criteria for funding, and we're recommending that it be approved. You may recognize this grant application because it was put in last year, but because of COVID, they were unable to run the program. They did pivot and do a ball hockey and inline skating program instead. So this is a different program than what they did last year, but it, it's similar to the program that was approved last year. So are there any questions? Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Seeing none. I was going to move. Moved by Councillor Hemmons, seconded by Councillor Martman. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any contrary? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Work. 
Thank you. Uh, the next is the Canada Community Revitalization Fund. Ms. Mercer, back to you. Thank you, Your Worship. So in early summer, um, the, Canadian, the Canada Community Revitalization Fund grant opportunity came up. And this grant stream supports communities in building and improving community infrastructure projects, bringing people back to public spaces safely as health uh, measures in ease, and to stimulate local economies. So eligible projects are prioritized as follows. Revitalize downtown cores and main streets, reinvent outdoor spaces, create green infrastructure, and increase the accessibility of community spaces. So the grant deadline was uh, July 23rd, with funding available of up to 75% of the cost of the project. Now, due to tight timelines, staff were not able to bring it before council for project selection. So, um, as such, staff chose the Maffeo Sutton Playground Phase 2 project to apply for as it met the, um, many of the criteria of the grant. Now, we didn't have a whole lot of projects that fit into this grant stream, so this was the one that staff felt was the most uh, applicable project. So, the project has a total budget of 663300 and it includes the supply and installation of an inclusive accessible playground for two to five year olds. And we expect to hear this fall whether we, will we, whether we were successful with the grant application or not. So this is just for council information that this is what we've applied for. Thank you very much, Councillor Berman. Councillor Martman, did you wish? No. Oh, it thank you. Councillor Brown. Thanks, Your Worship. I um, have a keen interest in this one, so I'm just curious, has the project already been designed? Um, and I ask because I've been talking for a couple of years about our philosophy to playground development, and uh, I'm just curious what this looks like. Mr. Groot. Thanks, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor Brown. Um, so the design is not 100% complete. The design process is underway, and it, previous discussions and comments made by um, um, Council are being uh, incorporated into that kind of thought process around natural play elements and how can we incorporate that into uh, and complement, you know, that phase one piece. So the, the design is not 100% complete and it would be something that we would um, be proud to bring in front as, uh, of Council to kind of show in advance of going to um, uh, market. Thanks so much. Any further questions for Ms. Mercer or Mr. Groot? If not, thank you very much. Much appreciate the update and let's keep our fingers crossed. The next is the quarterly purchasing report, single and sole source purchases in excess of 250,000 and instances of non-compliant uh, compliance purchases. Again, Ms. Mercer. Thank you. So the purpose of this report is to provide the committee um, with information regarding sole source, single submission purchases and policy uh, compliance for the city's uh, procurement policy for the quarter uh, ending June 30th. So Appendix 1 outlines our sole, sole and single source purchases. So in the second quarter we had 17 and the, the total value of, of those uh, items was just over $738,000. Appendix two outlines our purchases over 250,000. And in quarter two, we had 11, uh, totaling just over $17 million um, worth of awards. And there was no instances of non-compliance with the procurement policy in the second quarter. So I'll be happy to try to answer any questions um, if you have any. I don't see any hands up or nothing coming in electronically. I think we're satisfied, Ms. Mercer, thank you. The next is council expenses for the six months uh, ending 20, June 30th, 2021. Thank you, Please. Your Worship. So this report uh, provides a year-to-date uh, cost total um, to June 30th for each member of council. So this information is compiled throughout the year and is included in the Statement of Financial Information or the SOFI report at the end of the year. Um, and so this report is for information only and council has been provided copies of each of your expense listings prior to this uh, meeting. But if there is any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. 
I don't see any questions, but I, I think it's incumbent on myself. Uh, I don't want the good voters of the NAM to think I'm express, uh, especially frugal with their money. I'm probably more of a pain for staff because I like things on paper. So uh, whatever we're saving on internet, I'm sure we're spending on paper, lest anyone think that uh, I should uh, be standing out from the rest of council, most of whom are much more electronically friendly and, and modern. So I, I just want that on the record. And I think that applies to some other members of council as well. Any uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Mercer. The next are operating results for the six months ending uh, June 30th, 2021. Thank you, Your Worship. So the purpose of this report is to provide the committee with um, the operating results for our, uh, our quarter two ending June 30th. So this report includes day-to-day -day operations only, um, and operating projects are included in the quarter two project report that's coming up next. In um, some of our past years, we've included operating projects within this report, but we've um, um, included them in our project reporting as that's where really they should lie. So at the end of quarter two, we're projecting just over a $1.2 million deficit for all three funds. So at attachment one of the report gives a brief description of any variances that were over $100,000. And attachment two gives an overview of all the variances for all the departments. So just as a bit of a background on how we come up with this value um, or the estimated um, surplus or deficit at the end of the year. So throughout the year, the finance staff meets with each department to determine where they think they're going to be at the end of the year. So prior to the end of June, our finance staff sat down with each department and they estimated where they think their budget is going to be at the end of the year. And once all of this information is received, we compile it and that's how our projection of a surplus or deficit is arrived at. So the quarter two deficit is made up of the following. So the general fund has a deficit of just over $1.5 million. The sewer fund has a, a, a minor deficit of just over 17,000. And the water, fund is, the water fund is projecting a surplus of just over $277,000. So for the general funds, the largest contributor to the deficit is the RCMP retro pay expense in the amount of $2 million. So the RCMP members have been without a contract since 2017, and over the summer they ratified a new contract. So based on the preliminary information we've received um, about the settlement, we anticipate that we're going to be short by the $2 million. So since 2017, staff have been accruing a liability based on amounts received from RCMP E-Division. So they provide us with a cost per member that they think the settlement will be, and then we process that into our financial statements. However, it's looking like the accrual is, will fall short by the $2 million um, than what we've accrued. So we're going to pick up, we're going to have an additional $2 million in our income statement that we weren't anticipating. And really that makes up the bulk of why we have a deficit in the general fund. Some other items that contributed to the deficit were COVID related. Um, our parking revenues are lower than anticipated due to, the, due to COVID. Um, the revenues aren't coming back as fast as we as ex expected by just over $126,000. So um, that's adding to the deficit. Um, and as you may remember, Beb and Pool was scheduled to be opened January 1st, so we didn't budget anything in 2021 for the reopening of the pool. But now that um, pandemic restrictions are easing, we've uh, determined at the time of this report that we would be opening the pool October 1st. So there's some costs that will be incurred that we hadn't anticipated, and that was just over $220,000. Now, having said that, those are some of the items that contributed to the deficit. We also have some things, some positive variances that reduce that deficit. So one is position vacancies. So we have about uh, $359,000 in positive variance, as we have several position vacancies throughout the city. So those contribute to a positive variance, so that will reduce the deficit. Uh, with regards to casino revenues, Again, we did not expect any casino revenues for 2021 at the time we created the budget. We had no information about the casinos reopening. COVID has added an element of uncertainty when we created the budget. So we anticipated that casino revenues would come back on board in 2022. So as such, we have, um, we're 
estimating about $113,000 in additional revenue we hadn't thought that we would receive. So, and that's um, uh, given us some additional revenue. Uh, building inspection revenue, it, we're expected to receive about $250,000 more than we budgeted for as you know, construction is still going strong in Nanaimo. So um, we have a conservative estimate of about $250,000 more revenue there. And um, the Vancouver Island Conference Center operations, we're expecting a positive variance there of about 179,000. And this is operating costs are, estimate, um, were, are estimated to be lower than we anticipated. Um, and so there's some savings found here. So the deficits offset by some of the positive variants comes up with just over a $1.5 million deficit. So for the water fund, um, that has a surplus. We're expecting of about 277,000. Um, we have some position vacancies there, and that adds, we're estimating about $127,000. And we have some unused contingency of 100,000. And some small variances make up the remainder of that surplus value. So as the city is not legally allowed to run a deficit, any shortfall would be funded from the General Financial Stability Reserve. And uh, something to keep in mind, that quarter two is often a much more conservative estimate of where we think we're going to be at the end of the year because we're only halfway through the year and lots of things happen during the summer. So um, with that in mind, we will likely see a better projection for quarter three and ultimately at the end of the year. So, um, and we will do our best to make sure that we're, we keep our costs um, to a minimum. So that's the presentation. I will uh, open it up to any questions if anybody has any. Thank you very much, Ms. Mercer. I don't see any questions. Um, the bad and the good news is uh, pretty clearly stated. Not seeing any questions, thank you very much. Uh, the next are project results for the six months ending uh, June 30th, 2021. All right, so again, this, as I mentioned earlier, this report provides uh, the committee with a summary of the current status of our operating and capital projects as at June 30th. So projects are broken down into four categories, uh, completed or substantially complete, in progress, not started or delayed or other. So the total budget um, for all operating and capital was just over $114 million. Uh, 100 million, uh, just over, or just under 100 million was for capital and just over 14 million was for operating projects. To at June 30th, um, approximately 54% of the budget, the total budget was spent at uh, about $61.5 million. So 55% of the capital budget has been spent and 45% of the operating budget has been spent. So the funds remaining are just over $53 million and 45 relates to capital and 8 million relates to operating. So. Um, there was a quite a large attachment that hopefully all of you have your glasses on to read. Um, and it provides a listing, a detailed listing of all the operating and capital projects um, and their status at June 30th. So I'll try to answer any questions you may have for some of the directors. I don't see any questions. Again, report's fairly clear. Do you have any concerns about the trends as the city's with money projects, bags right now? Um, with projects, we're starting to see some supply chain issues impacting the ability to get supplies to, for some of the reports or some of the projects. So um, we may see um, more projects at the end of the year carry forward due to that. That's out of our control, but we are starting to see that um, become more prevalent. Um, so that's the only thing that we're seeing right now that could possibly delay some of the projects. So we'll have a better idea at Q3 where we're going, you know, what the impact of carry forward, the trend might be. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Um, it's a sort of question I'm asked every time we get this report. Um, but it looks like um, our delayed and canceled projects is considerably lower than it has been in the past. Am I reading this correctly? 
um, through your worship to Councillor Bonner, I would have to look at um, previous reports to compare. Um, staff has done um, their best to get as many projects started as possible. So um, there could be, uh, you know, a better success rate in getting all of those projects or more projects started this year. Um, but I, unless I looked at other reports, I, I can't really make a comment on that. Sure. Yeah. I think it's good. Seeing no other questioners, thank you very much, Ms. Mercer. We have no other business, Ms. Curry. And certainly I haven't seen any uh, non-staff faces in the audience, so we have no question period. Don, Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this was actually a question at the beginning, but um, you didn't see my hand raised. And it was regarding our budget uh, timeline, and I thought I'd just bring it up at the end. Um, I don't think anybody wants to bell this cat, so I thought I would. Is the E-Town Hall meetings that we have on our budget. Um, I've found over the last number of years they are not that productive. Um, there's not a lot of good community uh, engagement. And I was wondering if we could include in our budget a calendar uh, the ability to have our budget on our, um, on our uh, bang the table platform so that uh, more of the public who seem to use that on a regular basis uh, have the ability to have input onto the uh, budget. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Councillor Bonner and to Council, I know that is something that our communications staff has actually um, wanted to um, look at doing. So I think that Ms. Faroki could do her best to work with finance staff um, to develop um, um, the page for Bang the Table and get some engagement that way for certain. I know finance staff is usually um, stretched really thin during this time, so. Um, we do have some um, communication staff that um, Tracy Lowen, Ms. Lowen, um, assists with the um, designs and stuff for the budget book and the communications for the budget already. So she could possibly take this on. And yeah, I'll work with Ms. Mercer and see what we can do. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Bonner, for the comments. And thank you, Ms. Gurry, for the response. Motion for adjournment. Moved, Councillor Martman. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to staff for attending this morning.